<laughs> okay. Hey, so thanks so much for, uh, you know, talking to me and, you know, taking some time out of your day. Um, do you want to, do you want to talk about where you're, the job that you're starting up now? And so is, you're starting a tenure track job at, at Washington yeah. State? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, love to. So right now I actually just moved out here to Washington State. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at home right now due to coronavirus and all that. Um, What's that? I've never heard of it. <laughs> really? You haven't heard <laughs> yet. Well, you know, it's something that we're all trying to be very cautious about, yeah, um, yeah. which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, life has changed a little bit. I actually just started up my job February 1st. Oh and God. so things have um, been a little bit different, maybe starting out than, well, I guess than a person would expect. Yeah. But, you know, that's, that's okay. Um, and there's still things to do. Um, but yeah, a little bit, again, about my job. So I came out here to take a tenure track faculty position. Mm -hmm. And Washington State is a land grant institution. Um, yeah and a little bit about land grants. Most every state has one. Um, they were formed back in the mid 1800s by a government act that basically gave money. And like our mission is really to help the people of this state. Yeah. Um, so for instance, in New York, um, Cornell is part public land grant institution, part private. And so they're the land grant institution mm -hmm. there. There's probably a lot of other large yeah, I actually don't know how SUNY ESF fits into that because we're we're a forestry school, um, but which is kind of often something that you find at land grant institutions. But I, I don't know how we fit into the overall sort of land grant kind of umbrella um, for New York State. But hmm. I'm not entirely sure either. But yeah, <laughs> I feel it's my yeah. my my fault for not knowing that. Yeah, but that's 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 true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of bringing that up right now because I found that is a big part of the identity of our, sure. our university here and of other land grant universities. It's really quite important um, yeah. and part of why we're kind of trying to, um, during this coronavirus time, like be very careful about research, but also try to be doing everything we can to still stay open to help the people of the state and like the extension agents are working with you know citizens and the public and community and all of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So. Yeah. So what what can I? So you're just kind of like a, a high monopter and jack of all trades, right? Like you've you've done a lot of really cool research on different um, bees and wasp yeah. groups. Yeah, um, I have worked on a lot of different groups, and in a way that's, I mean, you could say in my line of work, I it's. A little different to define yourself when you don't work on like a very specific taxon sometimes yeah, as yeah. a systematist. Um, so what I am, I'm, I was hired in the Department of Entomology and I am uh, the insect systematist at WSU. Oh, cool. And actually then besides my tasks as like um, research is kind of first mm -hmm. and foremost at a big research institution and also teaching so i'll be teaching an insect taxonomy class this fall for instance and besides that i'm the director of our insect museum oh, and awesome. we've got nearly three million specimens there and um so that's also an important task just to take care of all of those specimens wow. um, and kind of prepare them for science <laughs> yeah so I guess I'm going off on a few different directions here. Um, oh, but, yeah, sure. I mean, I guess I just since I have these here. So kind of talking about, say, what I do. So like. Oh, yeah, you have specimens right there. Have, That's awesome. I've got specimens. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Well, I can show you. So this is just a small kind of travel box that you might have. And so. Mm -hmm. I don't oh, know. That's awesome. I'll take I'll take these out a little bit. But um, just quickly talking generally about specimens and their importance. Sure, so, sure. for instance, this is a group I'm working on. They're what's, what's the family? Oh, crazy. cuckoo wasp. So, yep, they're a type of um, a group in Hymenoptera. Awesome. Family in Hymenoptera. And so these are museum specimens, and I'm actually mm -hmm. able to get DNA out of them. And a lot of these, everything with a yellow label there, I've actually extracted DNA from, and they still um, like look pretty good. That's awesome. Um, 
So I think museums are really important. I think museum specimens, I mean, they'll be around for hundreds of years if you take care of them and people mm -hmm. will find ways to use them in the future that you maybe never expected. Like we're getting yeah. DNA out of specimens decades old, right? And older than that in some cases, but it gets, it gets harder the older you go. Yeah. Um, so I, I also find that an important part of my job to kind of take, take care of. Um, yeah, absolutely. Specimens that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so what, what's interesting about cuckoo wasps? How, how did you, how, how did you get into them? Yeah, with those, um, one of the reasons I kind of got into those cuckoo wasp is because there is actually not a lot known about their higher level relationships. <laughs> and so one of my first loves is phylogenetics and that's kind of what unites my work. Um, I work on the evolutionary relationships of different groups of hymenoptera. So yeah, parasitoids, bees, different types yeah. of wasps. And in this case, um, cuckoo wasps. And I mean, sometimes I still find it just amazing that within insects specifically, since that's the group I work on, there's like, say, when you talk about higher level relationships, like different families. So like, let's say paper wasps are a family and there's different families of bees and there's these different groups. And in, a, in many cases in insects, we don't actually understand, you know, what's related to what, their evolution. And that kind of hinders us from asking other questions about how evolution happened or the process and patterns of evolution when we don't know what their relationships are. Yeah, did, did you, I mean, you've, you've worked on figuring out what the sister group to the ants is too, right? It, did you did you work on that paper? Um, or was am I mixing you up with someone? Maybe some people that I've I've also worked with have have yeah, looked sorry. into that. Yeah, <laughs> there's some different types of aculeate wasps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I I did kind of work on a paper recently about bee diversification, mm -hmm. and so that like bees are polynivorous. So it's like they're the herbivores, but yeah. they are most closely related to these wasps that eat meat. So how did that happen? When did that happen? Um, you can start to ask why did that happen, but that gets into some territory that's a little harder <laughs> to, right, to test. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so, and you're using, you're using kind of a, a specific set of molecular markers called ultra-conserved elements for, for a lot of that stuff, right? Yeah, so, um, Ultra conserved elements, it's kind of a catch all term in a way right now. So it did start out as a little bit more of a specific sort of terminology about, you know, across a few different types of organisms. Like I think it was first found in like humans and mice, um, that there were these strands of DNA that were mm -hmm. just like a hundred percent conserved. So ultra conserved because yeah. <laughs> they were the same. So conserved meaning there weren't any changes. Mm -hmm. And so now we're using pieces of DNA in different groups of organisms that are very highly conserved. They're not maybe the same things that somebody was talking about 15 years ago, but they're just very similar across many different organisms. So it's like these chunks of DNA and it's, we're not entirely sure why ultra conservative elements even exist and exactly what their importance is, yeah. but there is some sort of importance in the genome. Um, but for our work is in phylogenomics or like looking at evolution, evolutionary relationships, we're not asking those questions of why they're there. We're just using them because they're there. Mm -hmm. And then because they're so similar, we can start comparing those against um, like basically using lab techniques to pull out these very similar pieces of DNA. And you pull out that exact same piece, you know, from across all the specimens you're studying. So I might pull one out of an ant and a wasp and a bee, and you pull out that exact same piece and then use analytical methods to kind of basically turn that into a phylogenetic tree or look at phylogenetic relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a way that's kind of just been developed in less than a, less than a decade ago. It kind of was first used in, in insects, um, or actually pretty much any phylogenetic organ, um, in a phylogenetic context about 2012 was the first paper published there. Gotcha. So it's pretty new, but a lot of people are now starting to move into that field. So I'm excited that I kind of already have experience there and can 
use that in my research now I'm, as I start up a lab too. Yeah, because when you're working with really old specimens, like the like the museum specimens, for example, it's you're often limited by how much DNA you can get out of of them and and mm -hmm. how how degraded the DNA is, right? So so with more traditional techniques, you would have you would be looking for kind of longer contiguous strands of DNA, you know, with like you know kind of the um, yeah, the, the more traditional kind of PCR-based Sanger sequencing and kind of approaches, you'd, you'd want to have DNA that was in really good condition. But with yeah. the ultra-conserved elements, you can work with DNA that's been really degraded and is kind of fragmented and um, yeah, it might not be, yeah, sorry. Very true. Yeah, that's one of the important reasons why we can use those because actually some of the techniques that we're using to amplify the DNA and sequence the DNA, we need it to already be in really short strands just for the instrumentation down the line for the sequencing uh, machine itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it doesn't matter as much if the DNA is already, we say fragmented, yeah. and meaning pieces of like a few hundred base pairs. Um, of course, as you start to get older, then the museum specimen is very fragmented, then you might have more and more problems, but yeah. um, definitely, yeah, these pinned, these pinned things I was showing you, I mean, they're not very big, and then you can soak them in like a special solution overnight to extract their DNA, and they come out looking pretty much how they went in. Maybe a little bit more dull in color or something, but it's like, yeah. unless you put a tag on them, like this, you know, some tag that I've extracted DNA from him, yeah. from him like you, hardly know. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Because I mean, that's, that's another thing as, as a curator, you have to be concerned about kind of the, the care of the specimens themselves physically, right? So, you know, there's some DNA isolation techniques that in, involve kind of destruction of the specimen. That's kind of the more usual way you have to, mm -hmm. that's what I was doing when I, you know, usually when I extract DNA, I, I have to kind of just grind up the whole specimen. But uh -huh. yeah, so it's really exciting. Um, for for small insects and old insects to be able to kind of pull out the DNA that way. Yeah. Are you still doing that sort of work or moving it? Uh, good, good question. Cause I, um, I was going to, yeah, I mean, I don't want to make this about me, but uh, I was, I was going to try to get a bunch of stuff done over the summer. Um, but Cornell, you know, a lot of the labs in Cornell have, um, have shut down a little bit. So uh, we'll, we'll see how much, uh, because I we don't have a sequence we don't have a sequencer uh, at at ESF so I was going to try to at least generate some CO one data um, so so doing kind of a more traditional approach uh, but um, yeah I don't know if I'll have access to a lab that's doing sequencing um, because you know yeah I mean the county that I'm in, in in New York State I mean you know Syracuse and Ithaca are not that far apart so you kind of know it's not you know, we're, we're not going to hit that hard by the pandemic right now, but it also still could be a while before uh, people want to do molecular work that's not running COVID-19, you know, samples and stuff. So, yeah, I know that's being prioritized on. Um, which is totally yeah. fair. I'm, you know, a lot of my questions can wait, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah but we'll we'll see if i actually get some of that stuff done this summer but yes eventually um okay. yeah i hope to um th this is actually an undescribed species in, in palau and it's it's one of the ones that i'm trying to look at um you know how much sort of uh phylo you know if, if, if there's a lot of phylogeographic signal within the archipelago um because the the thinking is that with endemic species there's there's more there's more signal because they've just been there for longer um, and then with introduced species, there's going to be less. It's going to be kind of more flat. Um, hmm. It's going to it's going to be more just like a recent, you know, kind of polytomy, um, or or they're just going to be identical sequences. So um, I'm I'm trying to sort of explore, uh, figure out who's endemic and who's um, who's introduced, but but also look at um, you know if there are correlates of dispersal morphology. So like kind of um, yeah, uh, mesosoma volume to metasoma volume, kind of, kind of that that ratio, the sort of like flight fecundity yeah. trade-off hypothesis and see if that oh, okay. influences kind of like the phylogeographic signal that you get in, in different ants, so. Sounds cool. Um, Are you 
Are you like imaging all of them or measuring just under a scope? Yeah, I'm you... just measuring under a scope. Yeah, I can't uh -huh. quite. It would be super duper cool to get like micro CT stuff like like the Economo lab is doing and everything. You know, like there's there's a ton of really cool imaging approaches that are just a little bit too expensive, I think, for my Oh, uh, for my yeah. project right yeah. now. Um, I'd like to move into CT scans. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't done it myself either, but mm -hmm. just just to explore that a little bit too about finding yeah. morphological characters. It's it's so cool, um, and it's just uh, you just have to have a collaborator that has free access to a uh, <laughs> to one of those machines because it's pretty. The one we've used the one at Cornell, and um, uh, the one there's one at the AM and H that. Um, uh, a lab mate and I and some other colleagues, we described some uh, some land snails from Burmese amber. And so the, the the CT scanning technology works awesome for like land snail shells in amber because the density is so different. Um, okay, yeah. It just, it, and, it, and with amber specimens, you often can't see the whole thing anyway. You know, it's it's kind of, um, you're, you're limited by what the amber, you know, by where the amber is transparent and um, mm -hmm. prepared and everything. So um, it was super duper cool to do those, but um, yeah, for, for doing enough stuff to actually uh, kind of test the hypothesis that I want to test, it would, yeah. it would be prohibitively expensive or, or I'd be in line, you know, I'd, I'd kind of be in the queue at, at the AM and H for like years or something, you know, cause that, that's a high use machine over there. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So I'm kind of I'm kind of trying to do the best I can with the uh, with the least expensive techniques, yeah. you know. Um, I think they're tried and true. Yeah. 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 But the cool thing, so with, um, you know, with mitochondrial DNA, obviously, um, especially since I'm I I have more uh, queens than I do males anyway. So it's kind of it's it's nice to be able to correlate kind of the matrilineal signal um, with like the queen morphology um but it'd be really cool to do a uce um a, you know an approach because then you could actually track like um uh if if there's you know to the extent to which there's speciation you could you could track hybridization or you know you, you get a more complete picture of of the stuff there so i don't know it's i've had my eyes on the the uce stuff for a while but it's it's just hard to get started if you're if you're alone. <laughs> no, I, I agree. It's hard because I mean, you need a lot of different reagents and kits and the, yeah. the right equipment in your lab. Right. Um, and so I've kind of been lucky. I was able to go like train with someone. Um, it was at the Smithsonian at the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was at Cornell. So I was at Cornell as both a lecturer and then I postdoc and, cool. and did some research there. Um, but I was able to go down and just basically use their facilities at the Natural History Museum, where they have an amazing molecular lab. And yeah. um, I was uh, I was actually um, I had a, one of these conversations with Jessica Ware earlier today. I don't, I don't I'm sure you guys have crossed paths at some point. Yeah, I, I mean I know her. Um, yeah. And and I'm aware like now that she's at the American Museum. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's so cool that she got that job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, uh, do, do you want to talk quickly about, um, kind of more like diversification questions or I, I also don't want to like keep you, um, oh, I'm willing to talk as, as much as you, as much as you need me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I could talk about like one in one aspect of diversification that I'm yeah. working on right now and, uh, and I'm pretty interested in. So I used to always say like, yeah, I study, I study wasps. Yes, different types of wasps, but I hadn't gotten into studying bees yet. Mm -hmm. And then at some point I started working more and more on bees. And this was in part because I was in a native bee lab at Cornell and oh, right. <laughs> with yeah. Brian Danforth. So yes, totally. bees. Um, and actually bees are incredibly cool. Um, it's just that I think wasps are amazing and and there's so many questions to ask with wasps. Yeah. So I, I started working more on bees. And the, as I said, one of the defining characteristics of bees, besides maybe you ask people and okay, they sting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's, that's mainly, let's say more honeybees. And that's a whole, that's a whole different issue. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so with bees, they collect pollen. Okay. Yeah. That's something really obvious, but, um, 
I think one of the interesting things, so there's over 20,000 species of bees that have been described and we, there's so many questions around how does an organism go from being a carnivore to collecting pollen? What are different um, maybe things that happen physiologically if you're going to collect pollen and be a generalist versus a specialist? So like, are you gonna collect pollen from every flower around? Or can you like get past some sort of secondary compounds from a plant and you know start collecting pollen on a plant that other, you know, there's no competition on? So there's a lot of broad ecological and questions and, and kind of an evolutionary time though. Um, but one of the things that I'm especially interested in comparing about the, the pollinivory is that there's another group of wasps that I haven't mentioned yet that also eat pollen. And so these are within the, the family Vespidae, which are like the paper wasps and yellow jackets mm -hmm. that you see around. Um, let's see, I actually sent out another box over here. Oh, sweet. Yeah, I got a few boxes of things. That's so, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this box, yeah, the only thing is, it's really, it's a little hard when you're like not right there, but these yeah. are all different types of Vespids. And some of them, so let's say some of the ones along th this row here. Cool. Those are actually Vespids that eat pollen. Huh. And to put this, in, and they look, you know, whatever, wasp-like, sure. wasp -like. <laughs> to put this into context, like, eusociality has evolved multiple times across insects. It's evolved, you know, many times in Hymenoptera, in yeah. bees, but pollen feeding, as far as we know, has only evolved three times in insects ever. So there's, as, huh. as in the, I should be a little more specific, pollen provisioning, so that the females go to a flower and bring back pollen to feed their young. Gotcha. So, sorry, I didn't mean to say, I'm kind of using general terms there. Oh, no, that's okay. But, I, yeah. Yeah, so just it's, it's a weird It's a weird audience. So just maybe just to orient you, a lot of our students are, it's, it's like a 300 level course, and a lot of the students are sophomores and juniors. Um, some of them have taken like multiple entomology courses because it's a forestry school and there's, there's a couple of really good entomology entomologist here so there will be like 20 students out of 180 that will like really know what you're talking about and then the rest of them will they'll they'll figure it out they'll, they'll yeah. follow along okay i don't want to bring you know i don't, I don't want to get too specific again for like um maybe the general audience but just to like kind of emphasize this fact mm -hmm. as far as we know it's only evolved three times in insects and in bees in these pollen wasps that I showed you, and then in one other species of wasps that we don't have a lot of information on, they're found in Southeast Asia, and they're in a, the family Crabronidae. I'm not gonna talk about those because we don't have a lot of info and that's only evolved once. The amazing thing is like we can use molecular information in these phylogenetic methods and basically come out with kind of a dated molecular analysis, and that's some things that, that I've been working on. So bees, for instance, might be in different studies there are anywhere from say 100 to 123 million years old mm -hmm. i'm finding that these pollen wasps are about 100 to 110 million years old so we kind of bring this all together and then you start kind of getting two things maybe doesn't make a pattern but we <laughs> in ev when you're dealing with evolutionary questions you you don't always have <laughs> um, yeah. the ability to like you know do a lot of replicates but okay, so then we see that flowers, angiosperms also evolved 130 million years ago by, by some estimates. And, mm -hmm. and all of these, you know, we're going by our, the best information we have. And sometimes things are updated, you know, they're hypotheses and we keep gaining more information. So say flowers evolved 130 million years ago. And then there's these groups that evolved after that to start using the pollen and like switching over in, in the case of bees and wasps, switching over from being predators to now being vegetarians. Yeah. And that kind of opened up a new ecological niche. So that's kind of one type of question that I ask. And then why are there, I didn't mention pollen wasps, 350 specimens versus bees, 20,000, or hmm. sorry, species, species 350 yeah. species versus 20,000 species. Yeah. yeah. Huh. But they're but the clades are kind of around the same age. Around the same age. It's not, yeah, so really mm -hmm. different diversification rates. 
yeah. potentially. Yeah, that's that's really that is really interesting. But then, how do those compare with their sister taxon? Like, are are the are the pollen eating wasps more diverse or less diverse than you'd expect based on their sister group? Well, if you look kind of widely, and, and it is a bit of a complicated story, but they're much less diverse than other, um, some of these other, you know, um, yellow jackets or, mm -hmm. or paper wasps. Um, basically, there's a large group um, of wasps that are quite diverse. The potter wasps are actually oh, the most God. diverse. Um, so, right. Sister group comparison is one way to kind of go about that, but also using different methods that kind of take the whole tree into account, dynamics, yeah. speciation, extinction, and, and all of that. Yeah. So I, actually, I, I, another person that I, I spoke with is, um, I don't, uh, Elizabeth Miller, who is a different Elizabeth, um, at a, the other end of Washington state, but she, she does SSE model stuff with, with fishes and things. So, so okay. she, she was actually looking at, um, diversification rates as a function of, um, sexual dimorphism in fishes. So, so kind of similar question, you know, similar overarching kind of like, why are there more species in some clades than in other clades kinds of questions, but, um, and, so, and maybe some of the same models, but, um, but very different taxa, very, you know, kind of a different ecological question, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. That's neat. Um, I mean, that's definitely trying to learn more about diversification. You know, you're going to read widely and see what people are doing. Yeah. A lot of the people, a lot of those vertebrate people are, are pretty advanced. <laughs> to, <laughs> they, have, doing. they just have better sampled phylogenies usually too. You know, it's, it's kind of unfair. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I, which is the great thing about insects too. There's so many questions, basic yeah. questions to ask still, but we don't even have phylogenies for our organisms in a lot of cases. And yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. So what, so the, maybe just to kind of wrap up with diversity, um, do you, which, which groups of hymenopterans are the most diverse? Do they, is there a particular ecological correlate that seems to predict which ones are going to be super duper diverse? Um, well, probably the parasitoids. And that's that's kind of a wide group of Hymenoptera. Um, they used to be called parasitica. Hmm. Um, so yeah. these are different parasitoids. Uh, the parasitica are a little different than these stinging mm -hmm. ants, wasps, and bees. So the females don't have, have stingers, but um, use their ovipositor usually to Oviposit into onto a host or, or some sort of substrate like that. Right. And I think a lot of those are, I mean, they've got crazy life histories. Yeah. And that a male might develop on a different host than the, the female wasps. Oh, or I, didn't know that. I mean That's there's cool. I mean, I, I guess there's is just it, so many examples. <laughs> is it host-based sex determination or is it the the mother's behavior that, uh, with ovipositive. Um, yeah, no, the mothers can choose that too. Um, and there's so many different cases. Like the mothers can kind of judge how how um, large the host might be and choose to div uh, have a, a female progeny in, develop hosts, in a yeah. larger host since they're going to be the ones producing the eggs. Oh, cool. Um, I had no idea. But parasitoids, and some of them are teeny, they can be like the size of an amoeba, literally, yeah. some of these things. Yeah. And um, there's just like, you can imagine like for every insect out there, there's some parasitoid that attacks it and maybe multiple and maybe a parasitoid that attacks that parasitoid. Yeah. And when they're the size of dust, you, can, you know, we just right. don't even have a handle on how many species there are. Yeah, so. some, of the, some of the smallest ones are egg parasitoids, right? They just yeah. they oviposit into insect eggs and the, mm -hmm. the larvae develop there. Yeah, um, and yeah. there might be ones underwater, there's some, like in the trichogrammatidae and kelsids, they, they actually kind of, the females can swim underwater and oviposit into like true bug eggs, like water, boatman eggs and stuff underwater. It's, that's awesome. There's just, that's why they're so diverse, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so potentially, so I think we're still teaching that beetles are the most diverse order of insects, but which might be true based on described species. That's but true. There are more. It's almost described. certainly not true based on real species. 
Yeah, I think even coleopterists would admit that, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just because, I mean, this just, it's really hard to imagine what, what you just said, that for every insect species, there might be a species-specific mm -hmm. parasitoid. That, and they're on spiders, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, that's pretty wild. I think, I think parasitoids are pretty cool. Yeah. They are, yeah, no argument there. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I, I, I mean, it was just really great to talk to you and, and hear about, um, you know, what you're working on and what you've been thinking about. And um, yeah, yeah. The, the organisms that you work on are so cool. So, um, well, I mean, I'm honored that you would think of me to um, interview oh, yeah. to be able to chat with. That's Absolutely. Cool. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks so much. And uh, just, I guess, you know, stay safe. And uh, yeah, in, enjoy yeah your uh, your new faculty job slash like work at home situation. Yeah, yeah. no, really cool. I mean as I said, it, it's it's working out all right, but it will be great to you know get students in, start teaching all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm, thanks so much.